Welcome to A Look Ahead. We're delighted that you've decided to join us. You probably know by now that we study the Sabbath School lessons as prepared by the Seventh-day Adventist Church. And this particular series is for the last three months of 2015, a series about the book of Jeremiah. This particular lesson is lesson number seven in that series for November 14 of 2015, entitled, The Crisis Continues. Hmm. So things are not getting any better, doesn't sound like, does it? So we'd like you to join us in a word of prayer as we begin the study of, of God's Word. We may interpret it and understand it correctly. Our loving Father, once again we open your book. We seek to understand what happened so many years ago, the challenges that your friend Jeremiah went through and the threats even to his life. May we, as we study it, recognize that things like this might happen once again, or at least recognize that there are things which we could do in our lives which might make a difference in helping those around us, is our prayer in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, clearly, and we've suggested back at the beginning, the book of Jeremiah is almost an autobiography of Jeremiah himself. A couple of lessons ago, we noticed the fact that the book of Jeremiah is, however, very not chronologically put together. We don't know all the reasons why that is true, but if we reorganized it chronologically, it would be very much like an autobiography of Jeremiah. Well, we do know that the king tore out page by page as it was read and threw it into the fire. Yeah, the first document that we know about, Jeremiah had written painstakingly, written out section you know, by section, I huge say, sections page. of his book. And somehow or other, the king said, I want to read this, and it made him so angry, he would read two or three pages and cut it up and throw it in the fire. I mean, just imagine that. So it was presumably recreated after that, but not in chronologic order. Well, as we look back, at the experiences of Jeremiah and the people of Jerusalem, their reluctance to follow the advice of Jeremiah seems incredibly foolish and sad. God continued to call for repentance and then offering them forgiveness. But before we think, boy, you know, we're, 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 we're fine here. We're not like those people. We should, we should remember what it says in 1 Corinthians 10, verse 11. And let me just turn there in my Good News Bible. All these things happened to them as examples for others, and they were written down as a warning for us. For we live at a time when the end is about to come. So that suggests that maybe most of the, or many of the experiences in the Bible were intentionally written for the purpose of what? Warning us. Warning. Warning us, who lived down somewhere near the end, right? Jeremiah 9 is a very interesting book. I'm sorry, book, chapter. Let's look at that for a moment. God said to Jeremiah, write these words down. I wish my head were a well of water and my eyes a fountain of tears so that I could cry day and night for my people who have been killed. Now, we haven't talked much about what's going on in, around in the rest of the uh, territory in Jeremiah's day. He lived through what kind of experiences? Three invasions, invasions by the Babylonians. Every time they came right up to Jerusalem, they wiped out the villages around Jerusalem, all the other cities. Finally, well, they had invaded Jerusalem and done damage to Jerusalem several times. Finally, at the end, they finally just wiped Jerusalem and just destroyed it completely. Even the Temple of Solomon was left as nothing but a, a, roof of, a, 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 a heap of ruins. So, If you didn't have a bulldozer and you didn't have dynamite, that would yeah. be a hard thing to do, yeah. wouldn't it? Yeah. But Jeremiah goes on to say, I wish I had a place to stay in the desert where I could get away from my people. They are all unfaithful, a mob of traitors. They are always ready to tell lies. Dishonesty instead of truth rules the land. The Lord says, My people do one evil thing after another and do not acknowledge me as their God. 
everyone must be on guard against his friend, and no one can trust his brother, for every brother is as deceitful as Jacob, and everyone slanders his friends. They all mislead their friends, and no one tells the truth. They have taught their tongues to lie and will not give up their sinning. They do one violent thing after another, and one deceitful act follows another. I mean, what would it be like to live in a situation like that? Look around you today. <laughs> hmm. And he goes on about how everything that God needs to do wants to accomplish through that. And he, he gets down there, uh, having said all this, um, I will, look, verse 11, the Lord says, I will make Jerusalem a pile of ruins, a place where jackals live. The cities of Judah will become a desert. Wow. And then those last two verses are incredible, which we'll talk more about a little bit later, but are actually verses 23 and 24, not the very end. The Lord says, The wise should not boast of their wisdom, nor the strong of their strength, nor the rich of their wealth. If anyone wants to boast, he should boast that he knows and understands me, because my love is constant, and I do what is just and right. These are the things that please me. I, the Lord, have spoken. Can you go up to verse 13 and next couple of verses, unless you're going to discuss that later? Yes. You want me to read that? Yeah. The Lord answered, This has happened because my people have abandoned the teaching that I gave them. They have not obeyed me or done what I told them. Instead, they have been stubborn and have worshipped the idols of Baal as their ancestors taught them to do. So then, listen to what I, the Lord Almighty, the God of Israel, will do. I will give my people bitter plants to eat and poison to drink. I will scatter them among nations that neither they nor their ancestors have heard about. And I will send armies against them until I have completely destroyed them. So this, uh, this has happened because my people have abandoned the teachings that I gave them. Yep. Now they've abandoned me. They don't want me. I've given them up. I will give them up. I will let them go. How would you feel if, if someone came, and assuming they're telling the truth, someone stood up in church one day and said, you people are, and he, he let loose with a list of comments about like this. It's happened. I mean, that's what Jeremiah was doing. He was standing outside the church. He finally gets down to, chapter, to verse 22. Dead bodies are scattered everywhere like piles of manure were on the fields. It sounds very attractive, doesn't it? Well, are we ever tempted to boast about our wisdom, our strength, our wealth? We wouldn't do that, would we? We don't talk about our new cars. We don't talk about our nice homes, our salaries, nothing like that. Well, look at this quotation, and this is from Education, page 263, paragraph 1. Those who think of the result of hastening or hindering the gospel think of it in relation to themselves and to the world. How many Christians do you know that when they talk about the second coming, it's all about what's going to happen to me? Well, few think of its relation to God. Few give thought to the suffering that sin has caused our Creator. All heaven suffered in Christ's agony. But that suffering did not begin or end with His manifestation in humanity. The cross is a revelation to our dull senses of the pain that from its very inception sin is brought to the heart of God. Do we think, do we even consider the fact every time we're tempted to sin that we're hurting God? Every departure from the right, every deed of cruelty, every failure of humanity to reach his ideal brings grief to him. When there come upon Israel the calamities that were the sure result of separation from God, so where did the calamities come from? Well, they were a result of separation from God. Yeah. 
subjugation by their enemies, cruelty and death, that's what happened. It is said that, quote, his soul was grieved for the misery of Israel. And all their affliction, that's in the book of Judges, chapter 10, verse 16. And all their affliction, he was afflicted, and he bare them and carried them all the days of old, Isaiah 63, verse 9. So, we need to recognize not only that we, that sin is self-destructive, but we need to recognize that it hurts God when we sin. It hurts Him. What does the cross tell us about the loving kindness, wisdom, justice, and righteousness of God? Now there's two ways to look at that. The cross is usually thought of from a Christian perspective as Thank, thank you, Lord, for dying in my place, right? This substitutionary kind of an idea. Thank you, Lord, for dying in my place. But I would like to suggest that the cross, while it, it does that, it really does that, that's important. Most important thing it does is correctly represents God. It answers very important questions about God to show us what the results of sin are, for example. We have a hard time sort of believing that. But when people are being killed right and left, not only by enemy armies, but also by people who should have been their friends, what protection is there for anyone? Is there a difference between God's justice and His righteousness? No. The word, the original words in the original language is no difference. So why have we gotten to be, why has it come to be so different in our day? <laughs> what was it, William Folk says, only the devil would make a distinction be between righteousness and justice. Yeah, <laughs> yes indeed. And then now we, there's courses in college called criminal justice. Mm -hmm. It's just uh, like a <laughs> criminal justice major. Yeah. Should we add to that only the devil or his followers would uh, take that class? Take that. <laughs> well, that's you know, make that <laughs> distinction. Yeah. Well, the cross was not primarily about us; it's about him. Let's look at Jeremiah ten one to one to uh, fifteen. People of Israel, listen to the message that the Lord has for you. He says. Do not follow the ways of other nations. Do not be disturbed by unusual sights in the sky, even though other nations are terrified. The religion of these people is worthless. A tree is cut down in the forest. It is carved by the tools of the wood carver and decorated with silver and gold. It is fastened down with nails to keep it from falling over. Such idols are like scarecrows in a field of milk. <laughs> They cannot speak. They have to be carried because they cannot walk. Do not be afraid of them. They can cause you no harm. And they can do you no good. Lord, there is no one like you. You're mighty and your name is great and powerful. Who would not honor you, the king of all nations? You deserve to be honored. There is no one like you among all the wise and men of the nations or among any of their kings. All of them are stupid and foolish. What can they learn from wooden idols? The idol, their idols are covered with silver from Spain and with gold from Ufaz. All the work of artists, they are dressed in violet and purple cloth, woven by skilled workers, weavers. Sorry, But you, Lord, are the true God. You are the living God and the eternal King. When you're angry, the world trembles. The nations cannot endure your anger. You, you people must tell them that the gods who did not make the earth and the sky will be destroyed. They will no longer exist anywhere on earth. And going on, but anyway, that's um, is Jeremiah the first one who came out with a message like that? Isaiah had one. Yeah, Isaiah 44, especially. <laughs> half of it, they warmed their body and cooked their food, and the other half, Cut they the bowed down, worship, and thank for for. All the <laughs> yeah, exactly. Well, God sort of summarizes how foolish idolatry is in Psalm 115. Let me just read you that, starting with verse two. Why should the nations ask us, where is your God? Our God is in heaven. He does whatever he wishes. Their gods are made of silver and gold, formed by human hands. They have mouths but cannot speak, and eyes but cannot see. They have ears but cannot hear, and noses but cannot smell. They have hands but cannot feel. 
and feet, but cannot walk, they cannot make a sound. May all who made them and who trust in them become like the idols they have made. And what are the characteristics of the idols they have made? Senseless. They can't see, they can't hear, they can't touch, they can't smell, they can't walk, they can't stand. They have to be nailed down. But they're a symbol of something evil. Yeah. A false concept of a god. This is another reference to we become like what we worship or think admire. and worship and uh, admire. So why were the Jews attracted to those pagan idols? Maybe it was exciting. Maybe they found some excitement in it. I don't know. What's I mean, we're, here we're trying to deal, uh, explain irrational mm -hmm. behavior through reason. So <laughs> kind of a... Well, we know that a lot of their ceremonies were, were related to fertility. Now, I would have thought that someone would have said, okay, hmm, if we worship this pagan god, it's supposed to have our animals have more calves, lambs, whatever, goats, kids, whatever, right? And if we, if, if we worship this god, it's supposed to do whatever, okay? Or make our crops more. Wouldn't, I mean, uh, of course, we're, we live in a scientific age where we think about this all the time, but you would have thought someone would have said, well, how do I know that these gods make my crops produce more? Did they just believe it because someone told them to believe it? Maybe they were infected with political correctness. Nobody could raise a voice with something contrary to the way the stream was flowing. How did they know that worshiping, following God would cause those things? Yeah. Well, they're told that in Leviticus and Deuteronomy. Well, Blessings I mean... Blessings of obedience and curses. You, I mean, after all the things that Isaiah said, all the things Ezekiel said, all the things that Jeremiah said, you would have thought someone would have said, let's do an experiment. But they had how many hundreds of years they've been doing this stuff, Yeah. you know? Uh, Jacob, he comes out of, of, when he leaves with uh, Jake or with uh, Rachel and Leah. They got their their idols. Samson's got a family of idols. I mean, this it's 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 an infection. Gideon? It, it just uh, seems to know no end. Mm -hmm. Gideon, well, did I see that? What's attractive about sin in our day? You get to do what you want. You get to do what you want. Does does sin make us more prosperous? Does it give us more leisure, more entertainment, more popularity? It's great for popularity, I think. I mean, they, they have these programs on TV I try to avoid, but these celebrations of this or that or the other thing, and they are just, I mean, what are they doing? What they're doing, every one of these shows, apparently, is trying to outdo the previous shows and, and, and craziness, right? Well, look at Jeremiah 26, verses 1 to 6. Now, actually, before we read that, we should, we should go back and read Jeremiah 7, 1 to 4. The Lord sent me to the gate of the temple where the people of Judah went in to worship. Now, who's, where, who, what, what do we know, how do we call that temple? What do we know it as? Solomon's temple. That was Solomon's temple, covered with gold, one of the seven, one of the seven wonders of the ancient world. Okay? He told me to stand there and announce what the Lord Almighty, the God of Israel, had to say to them. Change the way you are living and the things you are doing, and I will let you go on living here. Stop believing those deceitful words. We are safe. This is the Lord's temple. This is the Lord's temple. This is the Lord's temple. So what, what was their idea? What was their logic? Nothing could happen to them if they... Well, I mean, they thought, let's, let's just be, put it very blunt, God was responsible, at least partially, for producing this temple, right? So he's not going to let anything happen to it. He's, he, he's going to protect this temple. So if we stay close by this temple, what's going to, be, what's going to happen to us? It, we're going to be preserved, right? Now we might be worshiping, we might be baking cakes to the Queen of Heaven inside, but by the, this is God's temple, right? This is our magic protection. Yes. Well, look at now chapter 26, the first six verses. Soon after Jehoiakim, son of Josiah, became king of Judah, the Lord said to me, Stand in the court of the temple and proclaim all I have commanded you to say to the people who come from the towns of Judah to worship there. So 
Jeremiah, I mean, sorry, Jehoiakim has recently become king. They're probably getting ready to have some kind of royal ceremony welcoming the new king, something like that. And everybody's gathering around. So God says, say exactly what I tell you to say. Do not leave anything out. Perhaps the people will listen and give up their evil ways. If they do, then I will change my mind about the destruction I plan to bring on them for all their wicked deeds. The Lord told me to say to the people, and here's the message, I, the Lord, have said that you must obey me by following the teaching that I gave you and by paying attention to the words of my servants, the prophets, whom I have kept on sending you. You have never obeyed what they said. If you continue to disobey, then I will do to this temple what I did to Shiloh and all the nations of the world will use the name of this city as a curse. How do you suppose they responded to that? Here they are gathering to celebrate the new king. And Jeremiah is saying, if you don't change your ways, God's going to absolutely and completely destroy this entire city. Was that a popular message? Was he trying to be politically correct? Well, there are many places in Scripture, I'm going to just read two or three of them, where God says that we need to turn away from our sins, that sins are deadly. We need to turn away from them, okay? Let's just pick a few spots. Look at Second Chronicles 6, 37-39. Listen, you people, listen to your people's prayers. Now, this is in the middle of Solomon's prayer at the dedication of this same temple. Okay? Listen to your people. This is Solomon talking to God. Listen to your people's prayers. If there in that land they repent, he's talking about after they have been scattered into, into uh, captivity. If there in that land they repent and pray to you, confessing how sinful and weak, wicked they have been, Hear their prayers, O Lord. If in that land they truly and sincerely repent and pray to you as the face towards this land which you gave to our ancestors, this city which you have chosen, this temple which I have built for you, then listen to their prayers in your home in heaven. Hear them and be merciful to them and forgive all the, the sins of your people. Okay, well, pick another one. What about Ecclesiastes 7.20? There is no one on earth who does what is right all the time and never makes a mistake. Does that describe any of us? Look at Matthew 3, verse 2. Let's come to the New Testament. Turn away from your sins, he said, because this is John the Baptist speaking, because the kingdom of heaven is near. Okay? And so forth. We can go on and on. So all of us are sinners. We need to repent. All through Scripture, God has appealed to us to turn away from our sinful ways, repent, and come back to him. Finally, God reaches a place where he says repeatedly, I cannot bless you because you are obeying me. Rather, I must do it. I must do something for my people for my own name's sake. What in the world would that mean? Well, look at some passages. Look at Isaiah 48, 9 through 11. In order that people will praise my name, I am holding my anger in check. I am keeping it back and will not destroy you. I have tested you in the fire of suffering as silver is refined in a furnace, but I have found that you are worthless. What I do is for my own sake. I will not let my name be dishonored or let anyone else share the glory that should be mine and mine alone. Think about the mentality, think about the conditions that were got Jeremiah, or Isaiah, that was, you're quoting Isaiah. Mm -hmm. What was going on that got, got, or they had to use that type of language? It's uh, And it must have pained that God have to use that. Well, we mentioned in a previous lesson, God put them at the center of the then known world to be representative to his. And in Jeremiah here it says, in fact, maybe it's not Jeremiah, it might have been one of the other passages I stu we studied. They had become worse than the, P the Canaanites they had driven out of the land. What's God supposed to do with people like that? Give them up. But look at these well, words. He, he, he uses language that, that I'm going to bring this on you. I'm going to bring that on you. I'm going to do this. This. I'm going to do that. 
you know, if he says, hey, if you continue this pathway, you're, I'll let you go. That's too soft. But that's really the way he is. But he has to run the risk of being misunderstood to try to shake them up and get their attention. Is that rational? Yeah. Well, look at Daniel 9, starting with verse 16. You ha this is Daniel's prayer to God. It's a very interesting prayer. I wish we had time to read the whole thing. You have defended us in the past. Now, Daniel is saying, we know you, you prophesied through Jeremiah. We've already looked at one of those passages that how long is the captivity going to be? 70 years. 70 years. Okay. Lord, I've done some calculations and how long has it been? Almost 70 years. And I don't see, it looks like you're not doing anything. So, you have defended us in the past, so do not be angry with you so many longer. It is your city, your sacred hill. All the people in the neighboring countries look down on Jerusalem and on your... Remember, what did Jeremiah say? People who pass by here will call it a what? A curse, right? And on your people, because of our sins and the evil our ancestors did. Oh God, hear my prayer and pleading. Restore your temple, which has been destroyed. Restore it so that everyone will know that you are God. Listen to us, O oh God. Look at us and see the trouble we're in and the suffering of the city that bears your name. We are praying to you because you are merciful, not because we have done right. Lord, hear us. Lord, forgive us. Lord, just listen to us and act in order that everyone will know that you are God. Do not delay. This city and these people are yours. What's he saying? I mean, how could he make it more plain than that? There's a whole handout that I would encourage you to... To, to look at if you've got time and you are interested in this particular subject. It's found in our, on our website, theox.org, T-H-E-O-X dot O-R-G. It's under the section um, Teacher's Guides, Major Prophets, under the book of Ezekiel, you'll find a handout entitled For My Own Name's Sake. And, of course, Ezekiel lived at the same time as Jeremiah. So that's God standing up for his reputation. Well, in spite of, yeah. not because the people were good, but because of God's reputation. And Daniel, who's maybe one of God's best friends in all the Bible, what, what, what is he praying for? God's reputation. God's reputation. How many of us ever think to pray for God's reputation? Are we smearing God's reputation or are we honoring God's reputation? People who look at us and hear about us and think about us, Are they inclined to honor God's reputation? What do they think? Is God de desperate in our day to do something for his own name's sake? Are we representing him correctly? Or is he going to have to do something to try to preserve his own reputation in our day despite us? And for whose benefit? Yeah. Yes, Gordon. I want to read one sentence from Tuesday's uh, Lesson Study Guide and okay. get your reaction. Old Testament, New Testament. In the end, the message of God is the same to all of us. We are sinners. I agree with that. Mm -hmm. We have done wrong. I agree with that. We deserve punishment. We deserve punishment. I don't agree with that. You don't agree with that? Who, that implies we, that God is going deserve, to punish us. Maybe we deserve punishment, but yes. that's not God's way. Yeah, I, I, I spoke wrong. We probably deserve it, <laughs> but God is not going to do it. Yeah. The implication here is God is going to do it. Mm -hmm. yeah. Well, I've heard him say uh, many times on satellite programs, God poured out his wrath on his son. Yeah. God punished his son. I mean, it, it's a, <laughs> terrible. Well, we, we just read the passage that God through Jeremiah, marches up to the temple. Here he is. I mean, sta imagine him. He's standing in front of this beautiful marble and gold-covered temple. Fantastic building. One of the seven wonders of the ancient world. And he's standing there and he says, this building behind me is going to be a pile of rubble like the place at Shiloh. You think that would be a popular message? No. Because we read a little bit ago, back in chapter 7, what were they saying? Nothing could happen to this temple. I mean, this is God's temple. 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 All we have to stand is close by here, and if necessary, we'll run inside. 
nothing could possibly happen to this temple. Now review the story of the temple at Shiloh. Yeah, well, uh, the temple at Shiloh basically was the place where uh, Eli's sons had the, 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 the uh, ark and they decided we, we're not being very successful at defeating our enemies, so we'll take the ark out of the temple, we'll take it down to, uh, into the battle against the Philistines, and what happened? It was captured. It was captured. And when the word came back, not only it was captured, but what happened to his two sons? Died. Right. They were killed in the battle. And so the word, someone, a runner comes running back and tells Eli that your sons are dead, and his wife names her baby Ichabod, who's born about that point. And what happens to Eli, who's nearly 100 years old? Falls over. And he falls dies. over backward, and breaks his neck, and dies. The three people who were supposed to be high priests, all destroyed in one day. And the, and the, and the, and the, um, the ark is captured. I mean, you know, how, what's left, basically, right? Fortunately, there was Samuel, who was elsewhere, and picked up the pieces and sort of carried on, but Shiloh was a disaster. So, so what was Jeremiah? So they wanted to kill Jeremiah. They said, we don't want to hear this kind of message. Kill the messenger, right? And what was Jeremiah's response? Go ahead and kill me. But understand that the words I have spoken are from God. And if you kill me, you are killing an innocent man who was sent to give you this warning. Jeremiah 26, verses 12 to 15. I just summarized it there. Well, what reason could one possibly give for the res response of the Jewish leaders? I mean, who is it that Jeremiah should be killed? Who was it that said that? Leaders, the prophets, and the priests. The priests and the so-called prophets. What was supposed to be their job? Bring the people to God. Aren't, they, aren't the priests and the prophets supposed to be representing God correctly? So now God sends a message to Jeremiah. He, he, he takes his life in his hands. He preaches this message. The people are coming probably for the coronation of the new king. And they say, kill him. Well, in most parts of the war world today, we are not being threatened with death if we claim to be Christians. Christianity is relatively popular. Well, at least in name. Is that because we are not representing God as we should? How do we explain 2 Timothy 3, verse 12? What does that say? Everyone who wants to live a godly life in union with Christ Jesus will be persecuted. Have any of you been persecuted this week? Not really. Not really? No. Our lives are pretty comfortable. Well, where was this persecution coming from against Jeremiah? Church leaders. The church leaders. Oh, dear me. What are we supposed to <laughs> What are we supposed to learn from that? Shouldn't these church leaders have recognized Jeremiah's calling and repeated his message? Isn't that what should have happened? Shouldn't they have been out there calling for the people to repent? Well, what happened? Do you remember? Did Jeremiah was Jeremiah killed? Not then. Some of the ordinary people stood up and said, listen to this guy. This message he's bringing you is not a new message. Micah, and we have Micah's book in the Old Testament, a little short, one of the minor prophets, and the days of Hezekiah, a hundred years earlier, had preached exactly the same message. And he wasn't killed. So why should we be trying to kill Jeremiah? Well, fortunately, there was one person who had apparently had some power that uh, said, no, 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 leave him alone. And his life was preserved. 
Well, was that, now you, you know, you might say, well, okay, you know, they were just, they were just upset. They're just shouting crazy things. Or was that threat real? I'd like to read you Jeremiah 26, starting with verse 20. There was another man, Uriah, son of Shemaiah, from kiriath Jerem, who spoke in the name of the Lord against this city and nation just as Jeremiah did. Okay? So this is another guy who's doing what? Same thing. Same work Jeremiah is doing. Um, when King Jehoiakim, and he was the new king, they're celebrating his becoming the new king, and his soldiers and officials heard what Uriah had said, the king tried to have him killed. But Uriah heard about it, so he fled in terror and escaped to Egypt. King Jehoiakim, however, sent Elnathan, son of Achbor, and some other men to Egypt to get Uriah. They brought him back to King Jehoiakim, who had, who had him killed and his body thrown into the public burial ground. So, was this threat of death serious or not? Okay. Sounds pretty serious, doesn't it? Um, okay. Well, of course, we, said, we already mentioned Jeremiah's life was temporarily a threat. The threat to his life was temporarily averted. He, well, he didn't die. Um, but do we have some examples of other people in the Bible who went through something like that, something like this experience of Jeremiah? Can you think of somebody maybe in the New Testament? Stephen. Stephen. What happened with Stephen? Stephen was going to the local synagogues and preaching about Jesus. And the, the people who didn't want Christianity, the, the traditional Jews, became so upset by it, they tried everything they could to, to win in their arguments. Again. They couldn't. I mean, his arguments were so powerful, they, there, was, there was nothing for them to say. So what do you do when you can't silence an opponent? I mean, you can't respond, you can't beat him in an argument? Kill him, <laughs> right? Me. Kill him. So, of course, Stephen was hauled in before whom? The Sanhedrin, right? Yes. The, are these the civil leaders or are these the religious leaders? Religious. Well, they're civil leaders too, but they primarily were religious leaders. The leaders of the church. And what was the result? Well, Stephen preached his sermon and then they, they stopped up here. We don't want to hear this anymore. Took him out and stoned him. To death. Hmm? To death. To death. Yeah. Can you think of any other examples of times when people have spoken the truth and the church leaders didn't like it? Are you talking about more recent times? Well, even in Bible times, ones we have documented. Peter, Paul. Yeah. Look at Acts 5, <laughs> starting with verse 34. But one of them, well, I guess I should mention this. This is Peter and John had been arrested for, for, for preaching in the temple. They were put in prison. They got out. God released them from prison. They went back to the temple first thing in the morning. And what are they doing the next morning? Preaching again. Back at preaching. <laughs> preaching again. So they're arrested and they're taken to the Sanhedrin. And they give this, this, this speech, this incredible speech. Here's Peter who, who you know, sort of melted before, before Jesus died, when Jesus is on trial, he, he, trial, Peter sort of melts when a lady points her finger at him. And now he stands up and he said, You killed the Messiah. And what was the result? They were furious, but they and they wanted to have the apostles put to death on the spot. But one of them, a Pharisee named Gamaliel, what else do we know about Gamaliel? He is he was the teacher of, of he Saul. Was the, he was the mentor and teacher of Saul, who turned out to be Paul, who was a teacher of the law and was highly respected by all the people, stood up in the council. He ordered the apostles to be taken out for a while. And then he said to the council, Fellow Israelites, be careful what you do to these men. You remember that Thutis appeared some time ago, claiming to be somebody great, and about 400 men joined him. But he was killed, all his followers were scattered, and his movement died out. After that, Judas, the Galilean, appeared during the time of the census. He drew a crowd after him. 
but he also was killed and all his followers were scattered. So in this case, I tell you, do not take any action against these men. Leave them alone. If what they have planned and done is of human origin, it will disappear. But if it comes from God, you cannot possibly defeat them. You could find yourself fighting against God. That sounds like good advice, doesn't it? And the council followed Gamaliel's advice. Mm -hmm. Ellen White comments with these words, and, and our quarterly actually augments those words some. Hereby perceive we the love of God because he laid down his life for us. No doubt we can look around in nature and human relationships and the marvels of the creation itself and get a view of God's love, how much sin has damaged that creation as well as our ability to appreciate or even read it correctly. But at the cross, veils were torn off and the world was given the starkest and sharpest revelation possible of that love, a love so great that it led to what Ellen G. White called the sundering of the divine powers. What was Ellen White talking about when she said that at the cross there was a sundering of the divine powers? Isn't that, it's an old Eng, older English expression. Okay. It, bring, it means, as I understand it, something that is whole, they're all on the same frequency, the opposite to that word is asunder, mm -hmm. and we do see that occasionally in our media. When a cargo ship gets driven by a hurricane onto the rocks, it's torn asunder, it's mm -hmm. ripped apart. Mm -hmm. Sundering is the opposite. It is whole, it is focused, they're all mm -hmm. together. Yeah. Okay. So in what sense was the divine trio, if we can call them that, mm -hmm. torn apart by the death of Jesus? Divine power saw what happened, and they realized what they were looking at. <laughs> and any any doubts earlier on, the angels and the like that weren't too sure, that was what focused them. We need to re recognize at least one thing from the cross. Jesus died, and he had he fell dying to the ground back in Gethsemane, but he died on the cross, not of the beatings, not of the whippings, not of the crown of thorns, he died of sin. And we, every one of us, need to recognize that. This is what will happen to sinners if they refuse to give up on their sins. As egocentric human beings, we like to focus on what God has done for us. And that is not wrong, but we know that he, did go, he, he went beyond that. We need to understand the central theme of Scripture and the impact of the great controversy. Would sin have been eliminated completely from the universe if Adam and Eve had not sinned? No, there still would have been the devil to deal with. Yeah. The devil and a third of the angels. What yes. about the rebellion that started in heaven? Revelation 12. God would still have had to deal with that even if we had not joined Satan's side. We don't, like, we don't, we don't think about that very often. We tend to make fun of people who worship metal idols or stone idols or even animals in ancient times. But what are we in danger of making to an idol in our day? False concepts of God. False, False concepts of God. of God. A lot of people out in the world who don't even think about God make idols out of their cell phones and their computers and their iPads and their what else? Their bank accounts, their big buildings. You don't mean I, my iPad, do you? Oh, no, not at all. I wasn't talking about you. <laughs> I'm using it for holy purposes. Exactly. Well, so many people. I mean, we, we read it here in, Je in Jeremiah many times, but in the New Testament, all the way down to um, John the Baptist, etc. What exactly should be the role of repentance in our lives on a day-by-day -day basis? What does repentance really mean? Do we understand what repentance means? Turning around. Yeah. Repentance comes from a Greek way in the New Testament. I know the Greek much better than I do the Hebrew. Repentance is a translation of the word metanoia, changing your thinking, changing your mind, turning around, going in the other direction. Okay? Um, that's, that's 
What, what follows from that would be at one moment, mm -hmm. uh, a healing of the way we think about God. When I read this passage this week and was studying for this class, I thought of a couple of weeks ago I was in uh, the highlands of, well, not the highlands, up on the foothills of the Andes in the, in the country of Peru. And to get to the place where we were going, we traveled to a valley for some distance, a beautiful valley growing sugar cane and rice and grapes and corn and beautiful, beautiful farms. And then all of a sudden, we had to get to a place way up on the side of the hill. And so this bus we were in started up there, and the, the switchbacks in that hill were so sharp that Bud had to stop, back up, to get around the corner. Yes. I would call that a metanoia. <laughs> you get it really, I mean, and back, okay, you know, back, back, back. The brakes yeah. don't give out on one of those Yeah, backups. you hope, hope they don't, mm -hmm. that's for sure. Did they show you any of the wrecks down below? <laughs> no, they didn't, we, they, we didn't talk about those. <laughs> well, one of the most important passages, which we've already mentioned briefly in this whole lesson, is the of Jeremiah 9, 23 and 24. And we've talked about the wise who boast of their wisdom and the strong boasting of their strength and the rich of their wealth. But look at verse 24. If anyone wants to boast, he should boast that he knows and understands me because my love is constant. I do what is just and right. These are the things that please me. I, the Lord, have spoken. Uh, is it all right to boast about knowing God? Apparently, it's a good thing to do it. Really? What does it mean to know God? Well, uh, it's eternal life. Yeah. John seventeen three. John seventeen. If you go back to the beginning of the Bible, you read something very interesting. That very same Hebrew word, Adam knew Eve, his wife. And she says, I'm glad to meet you, shake your hand. They had a baby. No, they had a baby. So this is not just, well, you know, I'm happy I know your name. This is a very intimate kind of knowing, right? This is not just an intellectual knowledge of what God is all about. Is he calling for us to have a more, more personal and intimate kind of knowing in our day? But how can we come to know someone who we can't see or physically hear? Is that beyond our capacity? Well, in this book we have stories of Jesus who represented him. Mm -hmm. So by reading and learning and talking about at this table, you can become to know him. Who says you can't see or hear him? Have you seen him? Could you draw me a picture? Depends what you mean by seeing and hearing. Okay. Very good. And that's why we're talking about the word know. What does it mean to know? It means not to do something. <laughs> well, here's, 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 okay. here's the problem. Let, let's, let's, and I'm going to try to be a little more blunt for a change and once, once again. Yeah, no. Maybe I'm, if you think I'm getting too blunt, let me know. We teach our children the stories of the Bible, and they say, oh, they love the story of Samson, and they love the story of Gideon, and Moses, and Joseph, and oh, aren't they wonderful. But the Bible really is the story of God, and how he relates to, how he has related to so many people in the past, and how he wants to, wants to relate to us. It's God's story. Do you know any kindergarten or crater roll classes where they talk about the story of God? One, how one about not just kindergarten, but how yeah. about uh, anywhere, any level, yeah. Yeah. including the adults? I have a good friend who one time saw a bunch of young kids coming out of an Adventist school. It was, the classes were over and they were going home, so he just said to them, well, what did you learn in school today? And of course, they, you know, da, 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 da. and he says, well, what did you learn about God? And one of his kids said, oh, we never talk about him. <laughs> <laughs> What's the point of having a Christian school? So, how can we boast about God? 
what, it, he's, what he's done for us as individuals. Yeah. It has been demonstrated again and again and again that one of the most effective evangelistic tools is to tell God, tell people about what God's done for you. Yeah. I, I can think of some examples. And maybe I'll take just a second. I got called one night and I was working in Africa in a hospital where we had no electricity. Well, we, had, we could turn on a generator if we really needed it. Uh, but it took a while to get it going. You had to get people out of bed to go down and run the generator and so forth. So in the middle of the night, the only lights we had in the hospital were these little hurricane lanterns that were not much better than a candle. And they called me down there, and here was this little girl, and she was just about dead from dehydration, diarrhea and vomiting and so forth like this. And her skin was all shrunk down, and her tummy was just sunken in and so forth like this. And it was obvious. I listened to her. Even to listen to her heart and lungs, it was like, <laughs> kind of like that. I mean, it was, everything was rubbing. The heart and the lungs were rubbing every time she took a breath or the heart beat. And I knew that you know, if, if she didn't get some fluids in her almost instantaneously, she was going to be dead. Well, you can't give them by mouth. She's vomiting them. You've got to give it an eye. Okay, here's a black child in the middle of the night no, light. no lights. And I'm supposed to put an IV in this baby, and she's totally dehydrated. Do you think all the veins are stacking up nice and big like that so you could put an, a needle in it? No way. Hmm. And I just, I, I just, you know, I didn't say anything to mom. I just started praying. I said, God, there's only one. There, there are veins in the, in, the, in the scalp of babies, but even in the perfect circumstances, it's, it's a trick to get it into that vein. I said, God, if this baby's life means anything to you, you're going to have to help me get this needle into that vein. It's not going to happen any other way. I can stand here the rest of the night until the baby dies going poke, 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 trying to find this vein. And I took that, what we call scalp needle, and you all medical people, you know what that is, and I went, and it went straight into the vein. And I said, you know, that wasn't me. Yep. That wasn't me. Touch of the master's hand. Yeah. <clears throat> so, how does God feel about those who turn away from him? Sad. Interesting. Look at Hosea 11, verses 7 and 8. They insist on turning away from me. They will cry out because of the yoke that is on them, but no one will lift it from them. And then God says, How can I give you up, Israel? How can I abandon you? Could I ever destroy you as I did Adma or treat you as I did Zeboim? And Adma and Zeboim were two small villages that were destroyed along with Sodom and Gomorrah. My heart will not let me do it. My love for you is too strong. I mean, what does that tell us about how God feels? And finally, if we go back to Hosea again, look at Hosea 4.17. Uh, actually, uh, let's start with, with 16. The people of Israel are as stubborn as mules. How can I feed them like lambs in a meadow? The people of Israel are under the spell of idols. Let them go their own way. Could God ever have to say that about us? Does really knowing God as a friend impact the way you live? Would your neighbors and family members really be able to tell if you're truly God's friend? It is God's plan that his love and his character become a part of our lives on a day-by-day -day basis. We cannot do that on our own. We can't say, well, God, I want to be like you. Let me see. Let me be more loving. No. The Holy Spirit must come in and transform us. One of the places where that's discussed is Great Controversy, page 555. But when we refuse to yield to the transforming power of the Holy Spirit, we will find ourselves worshiping other things, creatures, instead of the Creator. People have worshipped the most incredible things down through history. The ancient Egyptians worshipped frogs, flies, and almost anything that seemed to have a prodigious capacity to reproduce. People made idols out of wood, stone, metal, and sometimes 
beautiful combinations of these things. I mean, you can go to the British Museum, you can go to the, the, the Louvre in Paris, you can go to the, British, to the museum in, in, in Berlin where these things have been collected. Beautiful, beautiful places. You can go to uh, Athens, you can go to Istanbul, beautiful archaeological ruins. And what does all that tell us? People were willing to worship virtually anything you can imagine. Some of those ancient peoples probably would have said that they were not really worshiping the metal, the wood, or the stone, but rather the God behind those materials. What is wrong with worshiping an image to the God instead of God directly? You remember what it says in the second commandment? Don't make no other anything. gods before me. Yeah. So if you... It became if, futile in their thinking. Isn't that mm -hmm. what it goes? Yeah. God says, I don't want you to relate to a chunk of metal. I don't want you to relate to a chunk of wood. I don't want you to relate to gold or silver, any of those things. I want you to relate to me. I want you to be my friend. And if you think God is nothing but a chunk of metal or a chunk of wood... What does that tell you about him? What does it make you think about him? Well, it makes you think, I can manipulate this God. Let me pick him up and take him over here. If I don't, if I don't want him to see what I'm doing, cover him up. Right? People have done that. Well, the weeping of Jeremiah as recorded in Jeremiah 9 was really the weeping of God. Jesus wept at the grave of Lazarus. We know about that story. But he wept even more as he came over the hill, over the top of the hill, the Mount of Olives, and he looked out on Jerusalem and he knew there was nothing more he could do for those people. And wh what happened? He wept so loud that the people... I mean, they were, what were they trying to do? They were, they were ready to anoint him as the king. And here's their king just bawling his head out. And what do you do under those circumstances? You just scatter. I mean, what else can you do? Have any of us, have we ever tried thinking about symbolism and thinking about what happened to Jeremiah so long ago? What would happen to us if we set aside all our electronic devices, all our distractions, and spent 24 hours a day focusing just on God? How do you think that would impact us? Would it make a difference? Would it make a difference to you? Think about it. Our loving Father, we are your undeserving children. We're so thankful that you don't punish, my, punish us in your anger as so many people think you ought to do. We're so thankful that you've given us all these warnings in the book of Jeremiah, for example. Help us not to make the mistakes they made, but to turn away from our sins, to leave them behind, and to turn to you as we focus on letting the Holy Spirit work in our lives and transforming us to be more like you is our prayer in Jesus' name. Amen.